We're back here again this Thursday evening for another edition of the show. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yemi Adebayo. Today, uh, we'll continue what we've been doing for the past few weeks, um, taking a look at the activities of sporting federations, how 2020 was, their plans for 2021, and how uh, they will try to see what they can do uh, in spite of the unique situation that we are all in. Uh, of course, uh, no thanks to COVID-19. So we'll continue with that on the show tonight as well. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. We're going to talk to someone you would love to listen to. Of course, he is a president of one of the federations. So um, just sit back, relax. We'll uh, tell you who he is um, in a few minutes. We'll also talk about Nigeria Professional Football League. It's, it's going to take a lag chunk of the show tonight. We're going to take a lot of reactions from the managers. Of course, managers played yesterday. Talk about the reactions. We have guys in the studio, uh, right here in the studio and far away in Port Harcourt who would uh, give us their perspective as to uh, some of the things that happened and uh, things to look forward to. And before we wrap up the show, we'll try to go to England, tell you what is going on. Arsenal currently um, battling it out with Crystal Palace. We'll take a look at what's going on there. Then the news about Andy Murray. What has this happened to Andy Murray? A big blow ahead of the Australian Open. We'll also discuss that on the show all for you tonight. But first, let me quickly introduce my partner in the Lagos studio. Bolu Amoni joins me this Thursday evening. Bolu, I'm always glad to have you here. Yeah, it's good to be again, especially in the moment where a certain Manchester United are now top of the Premier League table. They can't even remember when last they were there. Now, Arsenal, the resurgent team, mm -hmm. are battling it out today in the London derby. And like they say, in derby games, your form is thrown out the window. Sure, it is. All right, let's go straight to um, that discussion that I was, um, that entered earlier. Uh, let's go on and join uh, the president of the Badminton uh, Federation of Nigeria, Francis Obi. He joins us tonight. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's good to have you join us. And since this is the, since, since this is the first time uh, we're seeing each other, having a conversation, let me say Happy New Year to you and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much and I wish you the same. All right. Yeah, let's, um, let's talk about 2020 in passing. It's gone, I know. Uh, but a, a lot of federations still trying to uh, recover. A lot of federations didn't fare too well. Uh, you know, 2020 and uh, what happened in 2020. But w what was the experience of the Badminton uh, Federation of Nigeria? How did they handle uh, the, the challenge? Because it was a challenge um, in 2020. Well, it was quite a challenge, like you rightly said. Um, no one expected it. And uh, like most other people, we had to get used to it and live with it as it were. Um, early in the year, we, we were able to go for the All-African Seniors in Egypt. And uh, I remember very well that we were in Egypt when the first case of uh, COVID in Africa was announced. And it was announced to be in Egypt. So we, we virtually scampered out of Egypt to run back to Nigeria. And uh, of course, by the time we got here, all, all, all that happened is now history. So, I mean, we went into the lockdown and uh, nothing actually happened. Uh, it was a very tough time. And I know at the beginning, we were trying to reach out to our players to, to make sure that at least they were trying to do some form of exercise. Because at that time, there was a strict restriction, the lockdown, it won't go anywhere. And uh, of course, we, we also tried to reach out to them uh, with some form of support in the way of uh, palliatives and all that. So we, we, we try to survive and keep the game. But even in the midst of all that challenging time, there was still some good news that came out of bad news. Uh, it was during that period that uh, we had one of our umpires who was certificated by the DCA, that's the bad news from Federation Africa. And that was the first certification we were having in, in about 20 years. So it was a very, very you know, welcome development. We were very happy about it. And then we also had one of our members who was uh, conferred with the uh, African Women in Badminton Award by the PCA and the person of Mrs. Uh, Sholaja. And uh, also over this period, we started our online registration of all badminton players in the country. That is still ongoing. And uh, it's something that is going to help us, you know, with planning and a lot of other things. 
And, you know, we had partnership with some organizations that, of course, during the period donated face masks to us, both the reusable ones and the disposable ones from our Chinese partners. So I would say that uh, the period was quite, it was it was quite uh, challenging and, and right. difficult for us, like with every other sport, but we just okay. tried to keep things uh, going. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean to scare you, but the uh, big question mark over all sporting events in 2021 with the current situation as it stands. Um, 2021 is already packed because of the disruption of 2020. But now, a, a lot of, I mean, big, huge question marks, starting from the Olympics to even our mini, mini Olympics right here, National Sports Festival. Having all that in mind, how does it affect your plans for 2021? Well, um, I would just say that I, I, uh, we just feel in badminton, I mean, the board, the most important thing now is to just maintain a very positive uh, mindset because there's nothing that is within anybody's control. I mean, we are starting the new year. We are having the second wave, which seems to be more devastating than the first. So I, I would just say that we are, we are coming in very hopeful and praying that things would settle very soon. We, we have gone ahead, very, we'll be releasing our calendar for this year very shortly. We've put it together and we are hoping all things being equal. But the most important thing for us is the safety and well-being of all our players and all our officials and everybody, you know, in the badminton family. It's very critical because it's only a man that is alive that can come out to either participate in sports festival or go for the Olympics. So the first and most important thing is for us to, to all keep safe. And uh, we, we've tried to send that message out to all, to everybody in the badminton family in Nigeria. And uh, so basically, if you ask me, I, there's nothing really I can say definitely about the plans for what 2021 is going to look like because nobody knows is going to go. We are just praying and hoping for the best. All right. I agree with you. Health and safety comes first. Uh, a lot of people will agree with you uh, on that one. It takes somebody to be alive to participate in sporting events. That's uh, very, very true. Let's talk about badminton um, at a grassroots level. Um, I mean, you, you've always received commendation from us here and quite a lot of people from for some of your um, activities. So uh, I'm going to ask you that it's part of the unique challenges. Um, do you plan to continue with some of your efforts aimed at um, taking, taking the sports to all the nukes and creating uh, of uh, the country? Or probably there's going to be a slight adjustment because of the uncertainty around a lot of things uh, in 2021? Um, I, I would just say that... Um while coming to terms with the fact that, I mean, like we've been told by the medical experts and, I mean, other organizations that uh, this virus is going to be with us for a while. So we are all going to get used to living with it and at the same time being safe. So uh, for, for, for us in badminton, we just have to think outside the box and look for ways to be able to do as much as we can while being conscious of that safety. So basically, um, last year, we had planned to launch this shuttle time, which was to take badminton to all the secondary schools, as many secondary schools as possible across the country. Uh, but of course, when the pandemic broke, we could not achieve that. So we are looking at how we'll be able to have that uh, program flagged up this year. And uh, if, if the conditions are right, we'll, we'll do it. Now, for other uh, programs, for example, I, I was telling somebody that, you know, because badminton wasn't very popular, we we're trying to look for ways to draw people to the game, get them to come to venues to come and watch. All of a sudden, we are faced with a situation where we are now to discourage people from coming to venues. So it's not the other way around. So how do we, I mean, when we could uh, attract people to come, it was already difficult. So what do we do now? 
So, I mean, like I, I announced some time ago, we are developing an app that people can download on their phones and they'll be able to watch and follow games whenever they are. So that way, we are not going to discourage people, but at the same time, they will still be able to see the beauty and enjoy, you know, badminton being played at a high level. Yeah. So those are all ways we are thinking that eventually, because right now, I, I can tell you that normally when we have a championships, national championships, we, we have about 150 to 200 players. And that, that when we do that, we even try to, you know, to restrict the number of players that come from each state. So now we are now thinking of ways we will still be able to have those championships, but reducing the number of players that will have to come to the venue. So maybe we'll have some zonal playoffs and all that. And by the time we have the national, have a manageable number of people where we'll be able to observe the protocols and make sure that you know, we do all that is necessary to make sure that everybody is safe. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a totally different ball game. It's a challenge, but uh, we, are, we are determined and we are sure that we'll be able to overcome. All right, correct me if I'm wrong, um, from where I stand, one of the challenges that um, sporting events like yours do have is, is the perception that it's either elitist or, or that it's just leisure, that it's not a professional um, sport. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that could be one of the challenges that you, you have to grapple with as well. Yeah, and that's why we we felt the way to get around that was to create more awareness about the game, have people uh, being able to watch the game. You know, one of the things during the lockdown, there was a clip, a video clip of a rally badminton during one of the, I think, World Championships or so. I think there were two about, about two different clips that it went uh, viral because I received it from so many people, even people who were not badminton people. And a lot of the comments were like, wow, we didn't know the game was this interesting. So for people who think it's a uh, leisure or it's just a, it's not a very interesting game, it takes for someone to go watch a game of badminton for them to understand and appreciate the beauty and the excitement of the game. And the only way we can get more people to, 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 to see that is to be able to bring the game to them at a very high level. So basically, uh, it's a challenge, but... Like, like you, you said, it's something we have to grapple with and see how we can get more and more people to see the game at its finest. All right, talking about stimulating interest, um, that's also one of the things, um, I mean, that I thought about, I looked at, I also think it, it could be a challenge. You know, for, for, some, for some sports, football, for instance, you just need open space, one ball, I mean, 22 people chase it around. Uh, table tennis, get a table and, you know, but you look at sports like yours, what you would call the starter park, uh, the, the, you know, the courts, the, the, the rackets and everything, you know, so, some people might say, I don't think it's expensive, but some people might say, it, it's a bit expensive. So that, that challenge as well, how do you walk around it for those who are actually interested in you know, participating and probably hoping to become professionals in the sport? Well, uh, funny enough, I had that conversation yesterday. Uh, it's, it's a misconception, you know. Some people say badminton is elitist and some say it's expensive, but it's not. And I was breaking it down yesterday. For a beginner, for the children, for example, in the secondary schools that want to take the game to, you can get a racket for as low as 3,000 naira. And I don't think that is uh, so unaffordable. A tube of shuttle, nylon that can last you for months, I mean, you can get for about 6,000 naira. So, but, and which is why uh, this uh, shuttle time program, you know, comes in very, very critical for us because we intend to introduce the game to these schools. It's a lot of work that is going to be done. Train the games masters, take them on courses, and they organize competitions among schools that are so, you know, that we've introduced the game to, so that we can begin to discover talent from that uh, young age. So, um, and it just takes for for somebody to experience the game, you know, and, and what, which is why our partnership with our, our Chinese uh, uh, groups is very, very important to us, because we also want to make the equipment available and affordable. Uh, so that that misconception won't be there. People 
as they are getting to know the game, they will be able to. Because once you know you want to buy a racket or buy a shuttle or buy a canvas to play, then you begin to look for where to get. And that will become it. So we are, we, are, we are trying to make sure that this, this goes side by side as we are making the game more popular, making people more aware of the game. And they will want to take interest and say, okay, we want to play this game. How do we get the equipment? Where do we get rackets? We want to make sure that those also are available and at the same time affordable. So it's something we are, we are, we are looking at very critically and uh, very important to us for the growth of the game. Uh, finally, um, b before I let you go, um, I just have a question or two before I let you go. Uh, what about, you know, access to um, centers where, you know, you, you could play this game, uh, the spread of venues where, okay, I love badminton, I want to play badminton, I've crossed the hurdle of getting my startup pack and all, okay, where can I go? The, the, how easily, how accessible uh, is it for me to get to those places where I could play where I could get some form of training in the game? That's, that's a major challenge and uh, you've touched on there. I'll, I've always shared with people, it will surprise you to know that in, the, in, in Nigeria, we don't have a single dedicated badminton facility. There's none. What we have are multi-purpose halls. You know, you go to the various stadiums, you, see, you get multi-purpose halls. So, Badminton, table tennis, basketball, handball, gymnastics, I mean, taekwondo, just name it. So uh, in a week or two, when some other sport is using that facility, badminton cannot train there. And that is why it's a major issue for us. Um, we have private member clubs that have dedicated badminton uh, uh, halls, but those places, like I said, are private member. So our players can't just go there. So what we've done, try to get into some kind of partnership with these uh, clubs so that they can grant access to some of our players to train in very good facilities so that they will train in somewhere close to the kind of facilities they will play if they travel out to train. The world body also saw this challenge and in trying to still make the game as popular as possible, just introduced air badminton that can be played outside. Uh, mind you, even the normal badminton is an indoor game, but there are a lot of clubs. If you go to Abuja, you'll be shocked at the number of spaces around the city where you can play badminton. In the evenings, gardens, people have courts. The game is growing. But, I mean, when you are playing outside, once it's windy, you can't have, the, you can't enjoy the game. And of course, if it's raining, you can't play. So uh, the world body has introduced air badminton. And what is the difference between air badminton and the indoor? The shuttle is different. So they are, they've, they've, they've produced a shuttle that can withstand you know, the weather. So that if you are playing, even when the wind is a bit high, you will still be able to, to, to withstand it and you can enjoy the game. So air badminton, we are, we are going to formally introduce it. It was just uh, flagged off last year and uh, we tend to you know, bring it out here. But uh, like you said, facilities, venues to play badminton, uh, the, the indoor game is a major challenge, and we are grappling with that as much as possible. Uh, one of the things we think would aid the growth of the game is if we are able to have a dedicated facility. All right. I went to China on a visit, and we had a, they took me to some of their facilities. You go to a hall, you see 22 courts. In Nigeria, wow. I don't think there's any hall that can take more than six. All right. And that was in Potako Civic Center, where we had the All Africa. We were able okay. to put in six courts, and that was in the right. highest, I mean, largest okay. number of. Uh, All right. All right. Okay. Uh, Francis Obi, President of uh, Badminton Federation uh, of Nigeria, I want to thank you for your time on the show tonight. Uh, our best wishes to you uh, and your federation. Hopefully, uh, you get to carry out your agenda in 2021 uh, as much as the situation allows. Thank you for having me.